right, we have an interview now for you with a long-term, long-time QD contributor, Davis Balistracci. Davis's article, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Quality Improvement, ran in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. As always, this column from Davis is densely packed with information and observations using, as a point of departure, his vantage as a presenter at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's annual forum on quality. The most recent IHI forum occurred just a few weeks ago in December. This was Davis's 21st consecutive year presenting in that forum, so he's certainly got a great perspective on the changes in the composition of this specific audience, as well as the quality profession in general over that course of time. So, to chat about what he's learned and how that knowledge has affected his teaching and consulting practice, we're very pleased now to be joined by the man himself, Davis Balistracci. Welcome, Davis. Hello, gents. How are you? Good. Good. So Good. It's snowing out. out. So it's snowing out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We're in California. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. And you were in Hawaii. So let's, uh, you, you were out in the IHI I recently. So let's get right into it. Now, you were there. Yeah. When, when you're presenting to an audience such as the one at the IHI, the most important thing is to stuff them full of tools, right? Yeah, it works for me. <laughs> That's what I used to think 20 years ago um, when I was just starting to learn things. And as I've evolved, I'm just amazed at how few tools you need and how I, I'm still amazed at the awesome power of just plotting data over time and then intelligently asking questions as a result. In other words, applying critical thinking. Um, some researchers, in fact, it was a book back in the late 80s called Total Quality and the Executive's Guide for the 90s, which still has one of the best roadmaps I've ever seen. And it said to get an effective program off the ground, you only need 10 to 20 percent of the culture trained in quality tools, and you only need one to two percent of people trained in advanced quality tools. And as time goes on, I believe that more and more, as, as you saw in my article, I think what Deming did too is he evolved over his 50 years because he was always accused of not teaching any tools. Well, uh, if, if I can jump in here sure, a, sure. a little bit. Um, you, you, you touched, just a second ago, you, you said something about critical thinking. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that uh, the, the ability to think critically may be more important than most of the tools that you might be taught as a, as a, as a beginner neophyte quality engineer or quality manager? Well, you know, even one of your longtime colonists and my very respected colleague Don Wheeler says in the case of control charts, the purpose isn't to have charts, the purpose is to use the charts. He said calculating the right number without knowing what to do with it is, is worthless. And I'm using a saying increasingly in my work, I teach a mindset, not a tool set. Once you get, it's funny, once you understand the mindset, the tools to use become obvious and simpler. Whereas I see all these charts saying, use this tool in this situation. It's like ticking boxes. It just, you know, it's the old Steve Allen thing. Mr. Allen, do they get your show in Philadelphia? He said, well, they see it, but they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Davis, you know, one thing I liked about your article, it taught me a little bit, I did a little research on this. You referred to, to Everett Rogers' diffusion of innovations theory uh, to explain the changing attitudes of the attendees, uh, say, as an example, of the IHI forum over the years. So how do improvement professionals who were innovators or early adopters in the past differ, in your opinion, from those who are now just kind of joining what's, what's known as the late majority? Well, you know, it was sort of <laughs> the blind leading the blind, but, you know, we were a tenth of a step ahead of the participants. There was a passion, there was a buzz, there was a collegiality, there was respect for anyone who had knowledge. It was new, it was exciting. And, you know, over time, as happened with quality and manufacturing, remember there was a renaissance with Deming in the 80s. You know, there's this big renaissance, then all of a sudden, it goes from being a passion to being a sub-industry. And going from being a passion where you're, you know, you're sort of a maverick fighting against the tide, where, all right, we need a quality department, or uh, I'm gonna chuckle a bit, as I see happen in manufacturing now, I see in healthcare. Hey, you don't know what to do with someone? Put them in quality. <laughs> I mean, it's becoming a job, and it's just amazing how many people are there, and they're new, and you know, they, they, they just wanna take it in. And in fact, 
I am one of the longtime presenters. There aren't very many others. There are a few. And I'm one, a lot of the innovators, et cetera, have disappeared. I don't know if they've retired or, you know, it's bigger than all of us. I, I just don't know. It, it's just been interesting to watch. And then when they got savvy with their, I, I think it's a blessing and a curse, that, that 100,000 lives campaign, the link is in the article. Um, you know, all of a sudden, and, and the, the perfect storm convergence of these horrible events now getting wide publicity and the customer not standing for it and CEOs under pressure and people were joining it and they were saying, oh my God, look, look at the excitement. No, um, I think it's better, we better, better join this or we're not gonna look good because the day after they announced it as successful, I was giving, literally giving a presentation to the Michigan Hospital Association the day after they announced it as success. And I had 40 hospitals represented in the room and I said to them, how many of you were participating in this 100,000 lives campaign? Ton of hands went up. I said, so what was your, C, your, your executive's involvement? No hands. <laughs> and one woman raised her hand and said, they were nowhere to be seen during it except cajoling us for results. But when it was time to celebrate, they were all on the plane to Atlanta ready to ship, sip champagne. <laughs> and I still see the whole thing you know, healthcare has caught up to manufacturing. The CEOs now have the platitudes down, as Jim Clemmer calls it. It's passionate lip service, but don't let it get, you know, too much in the way of the real work. Hey, hey, hey Davis, um, just just really quickly uh, before we let you go, um, you said something that kind of caught my interest here. One, one a thing that Mike and I have been talking about a little bit is. There, there don't seem to be quality gurus around anymore. I mean, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, people could go through and say, oh, you know, there's, there's well, not necessarily quality, but there, there were management and quality management gurus who people were always talking about. Uh, maybe there was Coven or, uh, I'm sorry, Stephen Covey or Ken Blanchard. Duran, uh, right. Duran, you know, uh, people were still talking a lot about Deming. And that is really kind of gone by, the, it seems to me, gone by the wayside. Is it just because Quality is, in your opinion, because quality is kind of so infused in the mindset now of management that we just, it doesn't seem novel anymore? Yeah, it's, it's hardened. It's hardened into a sub-industry. Um, and what I think is happening is a lot of Deming's brilliance is coming home to roost now. All the, the current programs are showing various manifestations of Deming but quality is still seen as something you bolt on to culture. Where I'm trying to see, I, I think I'm finally starting to get what Deming said. I want to build it into the culture and using Deming's original premise by understanding variation. Simple, simple. And yet the resistance I get from execs is fierce, all capital letters. In fact, I, I uh, want to... Uh, tell people, refer to my, I think it's my October 2006 uh, SPC column where I have a dialogue with a world leader in quality who's still a world leader in quality. And he doesn't get it. Well, he saw it, but he didn't get it. Well, Davis, I want to thank you for joining us. You have a, you have a book out. We want to make sure we, we mention that. Yes. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about your, your book and your release uh, of that? Well, it's a um, new edition of my Data Sanity where I put in um, my 20 years of synthesizing Deming theory. I mean, I think I've synthesized it into a unique leadership package. I've designed it for execs and quality practitioners to create dialogue. In fact, the second chapter is eight scenarios, which would be considered everyday scenarios for managers to show the time they're wasting uh, for poor use of data. In fact, Lean should look at poor use of data as a process because it's 50% of executives time, an hour a day of middle manager's time, pouring over uh, useless operational reports, 60% of which are waste. Now, what could be done with that? And they draw circles and ask for explanations from busy frontline people, more wasted time. And, and Davis, uh, we're going to have a couple, uh, just for our, our, our readers, uh, if they follow uh, the link to Davis's article mm -hmm. uh, below the player page, uh, it's not there right now, but it will be shortly after the show. There'll be a, a, a link to a couple of excerpts from your book, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay. That's right. we'll, we'll get that in there and you'll send that to us. That's right. uh, so, Davis Balistracci, author of Data Sanity, thanks for That's joining right. us this morning. Thank you, gents. Enjoy the snow. <laughs> we'll talk yeah. to you soon, Davis. Bye. <laughs> Time to shovel. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> See you.